so much. Okay, uh, so we have our last uh, presentation by Grimmie Smith from uh, Mr. Colorado Boulder. Uh, Grimmie is going to talk about uh, non-additivity in quantum channel theory. So Grimmie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, what I want to tell you today, uh, tell you about today is really one of my favorite topics, uh, non-additivity uh, in quantum channel theory. It's sort of one of the one of the places where quantum channel theory uh, sort of diverges from and is, is, is much richer than classical. So Shannon theory uh, is just the study of basically sending, storing, and processing data. And generally what we're doing is we're interested in using some noisy resources to simulate some noiseless resources. So you might have this sort of a, a, a totally classical, oops, oh my heavens. You might have a, a totally classical scenario where you're, uh, where you're uh, trying to send uh, classical information from one place to another, but it's over a noisy channel. You might be interested in compressing uh, in compressing your data, um, or you might look at look for more quantum things, and that's what we'll talk about today. Trying to send uh, a quantum state from one place to another, or maybe you have some uh, some uh, noisy quantum states that are shared between two distant parties, and you want to use them to extract some really useful noiseless entanglement. The general difference, or the sort of the flavor, the difference in flavor uh, between classical and quantum sharing theory is that. In the quantum setting, there are far more resources, and there tend to be a lot more interesting interactions, and uh, that's what I want to talk about uh, today. So what kind of questions do we try to answer? Generally, we, we're still trying to figure out things like, what are the resources in this theory? How can we convert them to, uh, uh, to more useful versions of, of uh, or more useful kinds of resources? How do the different resources interact? And, and what's, what's the recipe for combining the different resources. So over here, I have a, the, a picture of uh, the cover of one of my favorite books, uh, Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast. That's the recipe for bread. Uh, however, it's a whole book to figure out how can, you, uh, how can you cook a nice loaf of bread. And that's because the way you mix the, uh, the ingredients together, the resources together, is critically important for your success. So for instance- uh, Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I think, I, I think the- um... Uh, the, 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 the it's it's frozen kind of so it's I frozen. Just make sure if uh, your slide is showing correctly. Okay. Um, does it say quantum Shannon theory at the top? No, it's I think your third slide, but currently it's showing uh, only your first slide. Ah shoot. Okay, hang on. Let me uh, let me see what I can do. Hang on a second. Um, I'm going to try something that should change things. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. That's better. Yeah, it's it's your uh, first slide now. Okay, but uh, let's see if I can get to the next slide. Yeah. Do you, do yeah. you see other slides now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thanks for catching that, man. It, I would have gone on and on because my slides. Yeah, my slides were changing. Okay, so I see how. Uh, okay, so I was just telling you what is Shannon theory. It's about uh, taking you know, noisy resources generally to simulate some noiseless thing. You want to know how well you can do it. Uh, in the quantum setting, um, you want to kind of figure out uh, what are the resources in this theory and how do we convert them? What are the best rates? How do they interact? And uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, how, uh, what's the recipe for combining different resources to get good outcomes? So here's an example of teleportation. Can you see my uh, mouse moving? Uh... I don't think we, I don't think I can see that. Okay. Uh, sorry. Let me try this. Uh, can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Sorry. I'm uh, my, my setup was somehow messed up. Uh, but, okay. So now just down here, I have the, the, the diagram showing you how to take two resources, uh, entanglement shared between two parties, um, and plus classical communication between those two parties. And, and uh, uh, send a quantum state from one place to another, something that you can't do with either one of the resources uh, individually. I have a question about the slides now. Do you see presenter view or are you seeing just one slide? I see just one slide. Perfect. So here's uh, an outline for the talk. I wanna sort of summarize a little bit uh, and start with uh, some basics of information theory. Um, well, one of the most uh, sort of central quantities in information theory is uh, 
is the channel capacity. And the idea is you just define it as well. What's the best, the largest number of bits I can send from uh, from uh, sender to receiver in, uh, over many channel uses in such a way that uh, there's a decoder that can properly uh, extract the intended message with high probability. Then the rate of the code is just the number of bits per channel use you can send well, and the capacity it's just defined operationally is well. What's the maximum rate you can get with vanishing error? Uh, so that defines capacity. But there's this mathematical characterization, which is absolutely beautiful. It captures the uh, capacity, which is this asymptotically defined quantity, in terms of uh, just the, uh, a single letter formula, a formula that uh, where you just maximize the correlation between input and output, where the correlation is measured with mutual information. And you only have to do this on a single use of the channel. And even better, the uh, optimizing distribution gives you a recipe for uh, making capacity achieving codes. You basically just make the code words look kind of like the optimal distribution. And uh, a feature that I, I guess I want to emphasize here is additivity of the classical capacity. If you evaluate the classical capacity <clears throat> on two, um, two different uh, channels uh, used together, the capacity of those two channels is given by just the sum of the individual capacities. So the classical capacity adds, and that, that's telling us that basically two different classical channels, they don't uh, interact in any kind of non-trivial way. They just kind of, you know, the best way to use the two channels is use the first one as well as you can and use the second one as well as you can and don't worry too much about how, they, how they're connected. Uh, so this additivity, it tells us that basically the resources are only going to interact trivially. And that's kind of like uh, if you're cooking, if you're making a smoothie, uh, the resources interact fairly, fairly trivially there. If you want a smoothie that tastes more like pineapple, you put a little more pineapple in. If you want it to taste more uh, yogurty, you put more yogurt in. It's pretty simple. Uh, and that's what classical capacities tend to, to behave like. It's it just to add. Um, in contrast, uh, what we find with classical uh, capacities and, and generically um, operationally defined quantities in, class, in quantum information theory is uh, they tend to be uh, have non-trivial interactions. So for instance, you can define a quantum capacity, we will define it later. Uh, and it tends to be that the, the quantum capacity of uh, a, a product of two, uh, two different channels it will, will tend to be strictly larger than the uh, sum of the individual capacities. So it matters deeply how you combine the two resources, just the way it matters deeply how you combine uh, the, uh, the flour, water, salted yeast uh, as you cook bread. So an example of this additivity showing up classically is this uh, is the this beautiful uh, formula for the uh, classical capacity. It's kind of not that hard to show that uh, that uh, the classical capacity is given by this regularized formula, where you evaluate the correlation between input and output over many uses of the channel and normalized by the number of channel uses. But to, this is still not that useful a characterization because it, it leaves you with an infinite dimensional optimization you got to do if you want to know what the capacity is. However, uh, the additivity of this, this correlation measure C1 here, uh, it tells you that uh, if you want to find the answer to this, this sort of large complicated optimization, because C1 is additive, you can just say, well, when I evaluate C1 on n uses of the channel, it's the same as evaluating C1 on one use of the channel and you multiply it by n because there's no non-trivial interaction between the channels. That's what gives you this nice clean formula, the sort of thing that actually we're not going to, we're not going to see, uh, or is not going to appear uh, in, in a quantum context uh, as, as frequently. So just as, a, as an example, let's think about the erasure channel capacity. What is the erasure channel? Well, it, it has uh, a single bit as an input and with probability one minus P, that bit just goes to the output. But with probability p, there's an erasure. And that erasure is going to sort of uh, show up as a flag at the output that, that the receiver can just see, oh, darn, those bits were erased. And you can take this channel and evaluate that classical capacity. And you find that its capacity is just 1 minus p. So here's a plot of it there. Um, that's actually quite amazing because uh, 1 minus p times, that means you can send 1 minus p times n bits, roughly. Per, uh, uh, if you have n uses of the channel. And that's sort of the approximate number of bits that don't get erased. So what this is telling us is that you can find codes such that each message you're trying to send, uh, it goes to a distinct code word. 
And furthermore, if some fraction of those code words gets uh, a fraction of those the bits get erased, the all the code words are still distinguishable at the output, and you don't even need to know which of the bits are going to get erased. You know, most of you know if you get a typical error, you're going to be able to you're going to be able to distinguish all the code words, even though you lost a bunch of them. So that's quite cool. And uh, there's something I want to note about this classical capacity is that it goes to zero down here, uh, where the erasure probability is is one. So for any uh, non-zero or non-unity uh, non uh, erasure probability, so for if there's ever a chance of uh, the bits getting through, then the thing will have some capacity because you can generate some correlation between the input and the output in that case. So let's add some quantum. Uh, uh, let's add some quantum to this information theory. Uh, I want to talk about uh, well. First of all, there are going to be some new things. But for a long time, people they knew about quantum mechanics. For, you know, approximately 30, 40 years, they knew about quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, sorry, not 30 or 40. <laughs> from the 50s or from the the 1940s to the 80s, so 30 years, people knew about quantum mechanics, and they kind of thought it was just going to be some additional source of noise uh, in. Uh, that you could address with some classical techniques. But uh, what people have learned over the past couple of uh, decades is that um, quantum information is actually kind of a, it gives some, a, a simp in some ways, a simpler way of thinking about information, especially when we're talking about privacy. And uh, it can also give us kind of a, a much richer theory in the sense that the number of resources and the, the possibilities for, uh, for achieving uh, communication tasks that are impossible classically are, are quite are quite wide. So it's not just uh, the quantum effects are not just a source of noise in in the measurements that you use basically classical uh, classical uh, techniques. Instead, uh, there's a whole new broader sort of information theory, quantum information theory that requires its own way of thinking about things and can sometimes even feed back to uh, classical information theory and teach us uh, teach us things there. So what is quantum theory? I'll just remind you. Well, in, in, uh, in uh, quantum theory, we have qubits uh, for two-level systems and qdits for d-level systems. Uh, but you should just think of uh, the, the quantum state as being a little arrow in some high-dimensional complex ve uh, vector space. It's a, it's a unit vector. And the thing, or one of the things that, that's sort of different from a classical uh, theory here is that there's this thing called measurement. And when we measure, we have to pick a basis. And having picked that basis, we can we can choose to measure in that basis. And the way that works is uh, the amplitude uh, in front of a basis vector, you square it, and that gives you the probability of getting the outcome associated with that basis vector. So you measure a qubit in the zero one basis, the answer will be either zero or one, and the probability will be equal to the amplitude squared of those uh, respective outcomes. So if I have uh, this vector up here, and I measure it in the zero one basis, I'll tend to get uh, uh, well, if it's this one, and here's the zero one basis, I'm going to tend to get zero more frequently than one. Um, but some of the time I'll get one. The inter or an interesting uh, uh, feature of the theory is that actually you don't have to pick a particular basis. You could pick some different basis. So you could pick the uh, plus minus basis that I've drawn here instead, and you can measure in that basis. Having measured, uh, what happens after the measurement is you collapse the wave function, they say. Uh, down to whatever the outcome of the measurement was. So if you start with this, this vector here, if I measure in the zero one basis, the outcome is gonna be either zero or one. And after the measurement, the state of the system will now be either in one or zero, depending on what the outcome of the measurement was. So you kind of got to pick which, which basis you're gonna measure in. And having made that choice, you can't sort of, after doing the measurement, go back and measure in some other basis instead. It's kind of, uh, uh, you can only get, you only get one shot at doing your measurement. So those are pure states, these little unit vectors. But um, uh, those are kind of the minimum uncertainty states, the most definite description of a, of a state you can give. But you can also have uh, states that are not minimum uncertainty, states where, well, it's the system is in one of uh, I different or one of uh, um, a bunch of different possibilities. And with probability P sub I, it's got state, it's in state uh, psi sub I. In that case, you can characterize the system with what we call the density matrix. And for that, uh, we, we find that um, basically uh, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. It has trace one. And that's the thing that kind of tells you everything there is to know. And every it tells you about everything you could ask about the uh, uh, 
about the uh, about the system. Um, uh, you can think of it, this density matrix, though, in a, in a somewhat uh, maybe funny sounding way. It's it, you can think of it as sort of just the it's the marginal probability or the marginal marginal state of a system uh, uh, that you get if you only look at uh, say system A rather than or system B rather than system uh, A. But um, a way of thinking about things that is often very useful is that whenever I have a density matrix that is supposedly, or that, that sort of has uh, rank more than one, so it's sort of, there's some uncertainty about what state it is, I can always think of such a density matrix as coming from a bipartite pure state, so a two-party pure state, uh, followed by a partial trace, so with one, with one system uh, discarded. Um, and actually, it's, it's, it tends to be very hard to keep a, an actual physical system in a pure state because there are these interactions with the environment and those interactions tend to cause correlations between the system and the environment. And we call this process of introduction of correlations between the system and the environment decoherence. And it's kind of the way states naturally become mixed when we're trying to make a pure state. And actually, if a state becomes completely uh, decohered, then we call it a classical state. And that's how classicality, that's how we believe classicality emerges uh, in the context of this quantum uh, theory. Okay, so we've got the states now. They're, their uh, density matrices, positive semi-definite trace one objects. And uh, now if we wanna build up a quantum theory, we better have some notion of evolution. How do states change over time? Uh, well, the simplest evolutions are just noiseless ones. And what they do is they conjugate the state of our system, the density matrix by some unitary. And if you were thinking of the little vectors, they just rotate vectors around. Okay. And a noisy quantum evolution can always be thought of actually as just a noiseless quantum evolution, some unitary interaction with an inaccessible environment, followed by some partial trace. So whenever I have a noisy process that takes a density matrix rho to n of rho, I can always say, well, I took my density matrix rho and I just caused it to interact with this environment according to a unitary, uh, a unitary interaction. So a good way to think of this, I think, is think of think about optical fiber. If I put some optical signal into a fiber, some of the signal is going to get absorbed and some of it's going to come out the other end. And the environment of that channel is just all the degrees of freedom in the fiber that absorb the light. And uh, the output is just, well, the output, the other end of the wire, uh, the fiber. Um, and in fact, uh, just like you can always think of, uh, of uh, uh, any density matrix is coming from a, a pure state, with followed by a partial trace, you can always think of any noisy evolution as coming from a, a, a noiseless evolution followed by partial traces. And this habit of thinking of everything in terms of pure states, and maybe there's a partial trace if you have a density matrix around rather than a, a wave function, uh, that's called often referred to the, as the church of the larger Hilbert space. Uh, you can always think of it, choose to think of things as being in pure states if you feel like it. And uh, there's kind of no, uh, there's no way that, uh, that you're going to go wrong in terms of making bad predictions. It's just a, a habit of thinking that tends to be clarifying, especially when we're doing Shannon theory. And we just call this, uh, this uh, noisy evolution, well, we'll call that our quantum channel. And what we're gonna be interested in for the rest of the talk is what are the, what are the um, capacities of such a quantum channel? So actually, there are lots of capacities for a quantum channel. You might use a channel to do different stuff. So for example, if you're sending classical information over the channel and it's just a quantum channel because that's what the physics of your system is doing and you wanna know how do I, how do I properly use this, this resource to get the most bits per channel used through, uh, that's the classical, that'll give you the classical capacity of your channel. You could also have a private capacity of your channel then you're trying to send classical information, but you want to make sure that uh, the environment of the channel doesn't learn anything about the messages that you're sending. Uh, this is uh, closely connected to quantum key distribution and the achievable rates for, uh, for those protocols. Finally, you might be interested in sending a bunch of qubits from one place to another when you're trying to use your quantum channel to do that. The number of qubits per channel use that you can achieve uh, uh, is called the quantum capacity, the best number. And that's what we're going to spend most of the time today talking about. We're gonna, I'm gonna tell some stories about uh, the quantum capacity of a quantum channel. And uh, I might hint at the fact that, well, actually there are similar stories for classical and private and, and all sorts of other capacities in these cases. 
But the, the quantum capacity is kind of the one that I think is simplest and also um, the one that I, I, I like the best. So we'll talk more about this. So what is the quantum capacity? Um, it is, uh, well, here's the setting. Just like in the classical case, I have some quantum, I have some quantum state psi here. I want to find an encoder that maps that state psi into a bunch of systems, each of which is sort of the input to the noisy channel that I'm trying to use. Uh, then uh, if it's a good code, I'll have a decoder that I can apply to the output of those noisy channels that can give me roughly the original state that was, that was meant to be transmitted. The number of qubits per channel use is the rate of the code and the quantum capacity. It's defined as kind of the best rate that you can achieve when we optimize over encoder and decoder, when we make choose the best strategies possible. There's a quantity called the coherent information that that plays a similar role to the maximized mutual or the, to the maximized mutual information that we saw in the classical case. It's defined a little bit more. Uh, it, well, it's defined in terms of this unitary uh, picture of the channel that I mentioned. So I have some channel, uh, we can call it N, but we need to think about if we want to understand how well it sends quantum information, we need to think about not only the output of the channel, but its environment. So we think about this unitary uh, extension of the channel. And we think about putting some uh, two party state psi RA through the channel to generate a three party state now uh, on R, B and E. This captures, this state will capture kind of what does, uh, what does the channel do um, or how much information, or, or what do I want to say? This, this state will capture the, the, the entirety of, of the uh, sort of channel. It, it has all the information about the channel, all of the parameters about uh, the unitary, all the noisy per, noise parameters about how N behaves. This state now will contain those and have information about them. And we can use it to say, well, how does this channel preserve information between its input uh, and its output? In, in terms of what correlation remains between this R system and the B system. Uh, but it's if we're trying to send quantum information from one place to another, we need to also consider what happens, well, how, much mute, how much information remains or is, is preserved between the R system and the environment of the channel. In fact, the coherent information that plays the role of maximized mutual information is given by this formula here. It's the maximum difference between the correlation between R, the, uh, between this reference system and the output minus the correlation between the reference system and the environment. The, don't worry about the factor of a half. Uh, it just, the fact that we're taking a difference between these two mutual informations is telling us that the coherent information captures something like how much more information or correlation can we generate between R and B compared to how much we could generate between R and E. And the excess, the excess information that we can generate between R and B uh, that is sort of more than what, what we generate at the same time between R and E, that's kind of, well, that is the coherent information. Uh, and why did I say this is analogous to the maximized mutual information? Well, it's because there's a, uh, a random coding theorem that tells us uh, it, this is an achievable rate. This coherent information is an achievable rate. In fact, if you choose your codes um, randomly, then you're going to achieve exactly this, this um, basically randomly distributed kind of like the, the, optimal, the optimal input here. Uh, you're going to achieve, you're going to have a good code as long as the rate of the code you make is, uh, is, uh, is around the, the coherent information. And actually choosing them randomly like that, you can't do any better. The, the, the performance is the coherent information. So the coherent information really captures what is the performance of a random coding strategy when I try to communicate over this channel. And the capacity of the channel is given by this regularization of the coherent information. Uh, it's the amount of coherent information you can generate over uh, a large number of uses of the channel divided by that number of uses. And you, then you take the limit of the number of uses goes to infinity. So that gives us a characterization of, uh, of the uh, coherent information, of the quantum capacity, but it, it, it sort of sticks around uh, a little bit more complexity has stuck because 
the optimization that we're we're asked to do to figure out what the quantum capacity is uh, involves an optimization. It, well, it is over an infinite number of variables, so it's not always uh, extremely useful. Um, I want to illustrate this quantum capacity uh, a little bit with the quantum erasure channel. So it's the quantum version of the erasure channel we saw before. I've written it in two different ways. The, uh, the first is just as uh, in terms of how it acts on density matrices. What does it do to uh, state rho? Well, with probability one minus P, uh, rho is, uh, is left alone. And with probability P, there's an erasure. So uh, that's very analogous to what happened in the classical erasure channel. Um, you can also write it out in terms of uh, this unitary interaction. If I have state psi at the input, it'll get mapped by this channel to, uh, well, a superposition of being in, well, having psi at the output and E in the environment, or having E at the output and psi in the environment. So with amplitude root P for the where P is the erasure probability, you end up in a situation where the state has gone to the environment rather than the rather, rather than the output of the channel. And we can evaluate the quantum capacity of this thing. It is just given by uh, one minus two P. So you can see from this picture that's strictly less than the classical capacity of the thing. And the reason is, well, we're worried not only about how much classical information we can send to the output, but also how much of that information gets leaked to the environment? How much, um, how much more does the output of the channel get than the environment gets? And I wanna draw your attention also to this, this spot right here. At a 50% erasure probability, uh, this quantum capacity goes to zero. And uh, that's very different from what happens classically. Again, I said, any kind of channel that has some correlation between input and output is gonna have a classical capacity. Clearly that's not true in the quantum case because here we've got a channel that can make actually pretty non-trivial correlations between input and output that nevertheless has zero capacity for transmitting quantum information noiseless. So we're gonna see a little bit more about, about that um, in, uh, in later parts of the talk. This 50% this erasure channel will come back, uh, will come back uh, uh, as a fun example. So let's talk about additivity and non-additivity. Um, well, I told you, uh, additivity, roughly speaking, uh, you have uh, trivial interaction between resources, whereas non-additivity, you have non-trivial interactions. And um, let's, let's look at some cases where we do see additivity of this coherent information. Generically, we're gonna see non-additivity. Um, but here's an example where we see some additivity of the, we see additivity of the coherent information. It's called a degradable channel. Uh, basically, uh, it's a channel where um, if, let me, oops, let me, let me just uh, describe for you first what we mean by a degradable channel. Basically, the idea is if the output of the channel can be degraded to simulate the environment of the channel, Right, so then, then the output of the channel has strictly more information, no matter what the input has, the output has strictly more information than the environment did. And in this case, um, uh, we can show, it can be shown that the, the coherent information is additive and indeed uh, the quantum capacity is just given by this coherent information. So the first lesson of this is, well, for some channels, this coherent information is right. So random coding is a good strategy for those channels. Um, and the second lesson I want to draw from this is non-additivity is really of, of coherent information. It's really intimately connected to the information that gets sent to the environment. It's not just about what goes to the receiver, but, but it, it's, it's really important to understand what's going to the environment if you want to understand where this non-additivity and additivity are going to happen. And maybe the, the third lesson here is that most channels just aren't degradable. Um, even if you, uh, and actually degradability is extremely fragile. So if you have two degradable channels and you compose them, now you've got a non-degradable channel. And in fact, this gives sort of some of the simplest examples of non-additivity um, of coherent information. So, so additivity is not really the rule, but uh, for some limited set of channels, uh, degradable channels, uh, it, is, uh, it is possible to show additivity. Uh, so there's another case where um, you can at least show approximate additivity and that's for very low noise channels. So if you have a channel that's very close to a perfect channel, 
then uh, the environment actually learns very little information about, uh, about the input. So very little information gets leaked to the environment if you have a very good channel. And this kind of gives the output who gets lots of information a pretty good shot at simulating what the environment gets. And if you can simulate what the environment gets, then you're degradable, then you have non then you have additive coherent information. And basically you can you can kind of mimic the environment by uh, by degrading the output of, of this near perfect channel in such a way that uh, you can strictly limit the size of the non additivity that you get uh, you would get for the coherent information. So if you have some uh, if you're sort of within P or you have some error probability P, the amount of correction to the coherent information, is, is order P squared. So this tells us that for very low noise channels up to really small corrections, um, uh, well, we have the quantum capacity and furthermore, the uh, rates can be achieved by standard random coding constructions. And this tells us for quantum key distribution, like really simple classical error correcting codes and privacy amplification strategies are optimal. So we do have some cases where uh, coherent information is either additive or approximately additive. Um, but more generally, what we find is non-additivity. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that if I evaluate the coherent information on a bunch of uses of the channel, it can be strictly bigger than it was when I evaluated on uh, one use of the channel and multiplied by n. So there's some non-trivial inter interaction between the channel and itself when we're trying to design codes. And maybe thinking more about the codes, it tells us that we can do better by picking some kind of structured code uh, for communication over this channel rather than choosing, uh, choosing random codes. And basically what it looks like is you pick some state on the input of multiple uses of the channel and you choose random codes that look kind of like that state at a smaller, at a smaller um, uh, uh, um, on, a, on smaller scales, it looks kind of like that state. Hi, Graham. Uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in the previous slide, uh, you have this expression. Uh, could we go? Uh, yeah. This? So is, no, is this. a statement here? Yeah, you know, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So this is a statement that if you take a channel n and if you compose it with a low noise channel, then you get this order p square correction to capacity. Is that the theorem or? No, the, 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 the theorem is that if you have a low noise channel, so it's Oh, channel right. that in in diamond norm is is P within p uh, of the perfect channel then the corrections to the coherent information for that channel are order p squared i see i see okay interesting so you expect it to be true that if you had a channel which was already degradable and you added to it a low noise channel uh, you would still have a similar correction uh, i expect that but I but but i would have to work with a whiteboard i think that i think that's true Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, so what's our goal with all of this? Well, well what we want to know is basically if you give me a channel, what, what kind of code should I use to try to achieve capacity? And what does the structure that I need to use look like? Um, and ideally, you know, if I had everything I wanted, I would have, we would have some compact prescription for generating capacity achieving codes in terms of some standard methods so like typical spaces, entropies, and that sort of thing. What we know now is basically non-additivity of this coherent information uh, is, is fairly generic in the sense that when you have a fairly high noise channels, then uh, you tend to see a non-additivity in this coherent information. And there are all sorts of examples uh, of this by now uh, that, uh, that you could go uh, look into. I wanna give you one of my, well, I guess my favorite example of non-additivity of coherent information right now, it's called well, I'll, call, I'll tell you what, it, okay, it's called the platypus channel. I'll tell you in a minute why. But it, here's what it does. It, let's start with a degradable channel. It takes zero to the maximally entangled state between zero, zero, and one, one. So that's between the environment and the channel output. So what does that mean? When I put in a zero, it means at the output of the channel, I got a, a maximally mixed state between zero and one. And the environment gets the same state. If I put in a one, it sends a two to the output of the channel and a one to the environment. This is a degradable channel. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess what, why, why, basically why that is, is that look, the output knows exactly when you put a one in and the environment gets a one when you put a one in, but 
if she sees a one, it may well have come from this. So, so the output of the channel knows ex sort of strictly more than the environment does. And, and you, you could cook up a degrading map that degrades the, the output to the environment if you want to. Uh, what I want to do is, is take this channel and add a, another input. So I'm taking a degradable channel and adding another input. Uh, it now maps, well, the input is called two and two gets mapped to a two at the output and a zero on the environment. So adding this extra input, um, uh, adding this extra input doesn't seem to help the uh, send information to the, the output very well because, you know, the only difference between what happens when I put in a one and what happens when I put in a two is that I send a different state to the environment. The same state goes to the output. Nevertheless, this channel is, is now not degradable and indeed is far from degradable. And it has some fairly simple properties. First of all, I can figure out its classical and private capacities and they're just equal to one. Um, furthermore, if I think about this, the channels that, that goes to the environment rather than the output. So I think about the, the environment's view of the channel. They also have capacity one. So I can send lots of information to the environment, uh, even privately, or lots of information to the output, even privately. But uh, the issue is I kind of have to make a choice. I can't simultaneously do those things. I have to use different strategies to achieve those two, those two uh, uh, different goals of sending information to either the output or the environment. And uh, I like this channel, especially because even though it's very, very simple in terms of classical communication and private classical communication, when we look at what happens with sending quantum information, the coherent information is now uh, non-additive, um, even for not such low noise uh, settings, or sorry, not such high noise settings. So I, even away from where it's equal to zero, it can go non-additive. And the state that we use to achieve this non-additivity, the optimizing state for this optimization implicit in, uh, in uh, coherent information is, is not the usual one. So that's, I mean, for me, it's kind of a, uh, an exciting example of a non-additivity of coherent information that we kind of don't understand as well as we understand the others. So a kind of summary of non-additivity uh, is, is, well, why do we look at these things? Well, we look at them because we're hoping the clean examples are going to help us work to, towards general coding strategies. And specifically, there are new features of this platypus channel pointing towards uh, some a different and maybe more environmentally focused or environmental focused uh, uh, approach to the quantum capacity. And our goal underlying all of this exploration is to figure out sort of the recipe for generating good quantum error correcting codes. So next, uh, I would like to talk about some extremely noisy channels and uh, uh, even look at zero quantum capacity channels. So I mentioned that uh, a zero classical capacity channel, it looks like this. If there's a correlation between input and output, it, uh, it, uh, it has capacity, classical capacity. So the only way to have no classical capacity is to have no such correlation. It's a very boring sort of channel. But uh, we saw with the erasure channel that at 50% erasure probability, the uh, quantum capacity goes to zero. And actually, it, you should think of the erasure channel as some kind of like um, mm, lossy channel, like you're losing a half of the signal at 50% erasure probability. Uh, and that, is, well, we'll see why the half is an important, an important number in a moment, but there's sort of other kinds of quantum channels that don't have any quantum capacity uh, or have zero quantum capacity that are really different from the, the erasure channel. At 50% at erasure probability, basically there's a symmetry between the output of the channel and the environment of the channel, and that prevents any quantum capacity. These, uh, we call them PPT channels, they become, they, they're very noisy. They're more noisy than lossy. And they have the property that actually they're extremely asymmetrical, even though they're too noisy to send any quantum information. Uh, so, um, what I want to do next is kind of give you a feel for why this 50% erasure channel has zero quantum capacity. And uh, I also kind of want to emphasize for, <clears throat> for you that, you know, there's a reason for, for having zero quantum capacity. And what sort of the meta reason is actually that quantum information is extremely delicate. And as a result, 
there are there are lots of different channels that have non-trivial uh, correlate that can send non-trivial amounts of classical information and non-trivial even private information that nevertheless are sort of too disruptive to uh, to allow you to send any quantum information over them. So let's talk about the no cloning theorem. The no cloning theorem is is a very simple fact about quantum theory. It says that there's no physical operation that can copy an unknown quantum state. And it's basically because all physical operations in quantum theory are linear, but uh, this mapping from one copy of state psi to two copies of psi, state psi, it's not linear. Uh, and if I had to call it anything, I'd call it quadratic. Uh, but the fact that it's not linear, actually, there's something even stronger we can say. We can say that any process that's going to leak information about your state necessarily is going to corrupt it. There's sort of, and that's that's kind of a corollary of uh, the fact that, that uh, well, quantum evolution is always linear. And this no cloning theorem, I, I, it's really at the heart of how classical and quantum information differ. And if you made me come up with like one thing that, uh, that makes classical information different or quantum information different from classical, I'd say, well, you can copy classical information, but you can't copy quantum information. And that's, that's the difference. So now look, let's look at what this no cloning tells us uh, about zero quantum capacity channels. Let's look at a symmetric channel. So maybe the 50% attenuation channel, or, oh, sorry, the 50% erasure channel, or down here, I have the 50% attenuation channel. It just sort of eats half of uh, the input signal and uh, the other half goes out the output. Um, let's say I have such a, a channel. It's symmetric in the environment and the output. So that means if I swap the environment of the output, you don't see any difference uh, in either of the systems. So let's suppose such a channel has a positive quantum capacity. Well, then there's got to be, when I use many uses of that channel, there's got to be an encoder and a decoder that lets me send at least a qubit from the input to the output. Given such a decoder, however, uh, an encoder and decoder, I could equally well, instead of decoding at the output of the channel, because this is a symmetric channel, I could equally well decode at the environment of the channel and get out the original state as well. But that's a no-no. That's that violates uh, no cloning, and that means that any symmetric channel that's symmetric between the output and the environment needs to have zero quantum capacity. And in fact, all known zero quantum capacity channels they have a reason like this for having zero zero quantum capacity. There's some there's some illegal move in quantum theory that you would be able to do if you could have capacity for such channels. So that's at least one example where we know right here, 50% erasure, that the quantum capacity needs to be zero. And we know why, it's because of no cloning. The funny thing that happens is you can find pairs of noisy quantum channels. Um, um, one of them will be symmetric and one of them will be one of these very asymmetrical but still very noisy quantum channels. And uh, given those two channels, well, they each have individually a quantum capacity of zero. And classically, if you have two channels with any given pair of capacities for them, this, the joint channel has, has just a capacity that's equal to the sum. So you might have guessed that what we find here is uh, a zero quantum capacity channel when we put the two things together. But in fact, it's possible to send, uh, to send quantum information across the joint channel, even though the individual channels can't send any quantum information on their own. And when we found this, we thought, well, that's a, that's a cute kind of little example. Um, but what has happened, I guess, in the years since that is that, you know, wherever you look, you kind of see, it, send, it seems to be generic. Whenever you look at very noisy channels, you tend to be able to find a, no a pair of them, or you tend to be able to find two different channels. Well, you give me one noisy channel, I tend to be able to find a second one where if I put the two things together, even though they individually have zero quantum capacity, uh, it's possible uh, or, or it, it arises that, that if you use the right coding strategies, you'll be able to use the two things to send quantum information reliably. So non-additivity and additivity um, are two of the kind of themes I've, I've discussed. Um, additivity, it tells us we're on the right track with random coding, but non-additivity tells us we're really missing some key ideas about generating good structured codes. And often what has happened is complicated examples have tended to obscure what's going on uh, in terms of non-additivities. And we've been finding increasingly simple examples of non-additivity that are pointing us towards new strategies, hopefully, I think, with a more explicit role of the environment. 
Um, and I focused on coherent information and it's not non-additivity and what that means for quantum capacity, but there are similar stories for classical capacity and private capacity too. Um, by the way, I, I just wanted to say, this was like, a, we're not gonna talk about AC magnetic field sensing. It's just like, a, it was an aside because I'm excited about it these days, but it looks, I, I think I, I would rather just focus on the next section and finish it uh, in a timely fashion rather than, rather than uh, tell you this sort of second story that I was, I was, I was going to tackle. So let's look at a very, a very, uh, well, a, se a sense in which quantum resources can enhance the performance of classical networks. So let's look at a really simple classical network, just a multiple access channel. It has two senders um, and one receiver. So uh, you might think of it as, you know, cell phones are, are, uh, are communicating into the, uh, into the tower, or if you want to think about things more mathematically, well, it's just some uh, conditional probability distribution that conditioned on messages from A and B give some output letter Z. Um, the goal for understanding this multiple access channel is, uh, is to figure out what's the capacity region? What are the rate pairs that can be achieved with, uh, with probability uh, of, with error probabilities vanishing as the number of channel uses goes to zero? Uh, it tends to be sort of a, a curved line uh, like this, it, because, well, one thing you could do is just take turns using the channel. And in that case, you, if you just took turns, you'd sort of achieve this diagonal line here. And what this curved line is telling us is that by cooperating, the two senders can actually, they can actually um, do better than they could if they just took turns. But the, the fact that it sort of curves across like this tells us there is indeed a trade-off between how much rate you can get uh, uh, from first sender to the receiver uh, compared to the second sender to the receiver. So there's a genuine trade-off there. This is like a, a classic um, problem that you can look up in, uh, in uh, you know, the Coburn Thomas information theory textbook. It's, it's like the, the canonical informa uh, network information theory problem that you can really solve. Uh, it's what, what do you do? You just sort of put independent random variables into the channel and you have these information, you have these sort of entropic quantities that give you bounds on the rates that you can achieve and any rate pairs that you can find uh, distributions uh, such that the rate pairs satisfy these inequalities where the entropies are evaluated on the distributions you used, um, any such rate pairs are achievable. And in fact, if you take the convex hull of all such rate pairs, uh, that gives you the capacity region for the multiple access channel. So that's just kind of done. You've got the capacity, you give me a, you give me a, uh, a uh, channel and this tells you sort of an optimization problem that you have to do on a single use of the channel in order to extract what the capacity region is and therefore extract, uh, you know, information about the capacity achieving uh, distributions you should use and what the codes you, you build up should look like. So what's quite fun is that if I take this totally classical network and say now, suppose the two senders, instead of sending, well, they're still trying to send classical information. Each one of them have their own messages they're trying to send to the receiver. But I, I let them use entanglement. I yet let them, the two senders, share some entanglement between them. Um, the sort of surprising thing that happens in this case is the entanglement, the possibility of using entanglement uh, allows these users to, to, uh, to uh, achieve higher communication rates for this totally classical task than they could get without the entanglement. This is very different from what happens with a single sender, single receiver. And to, in that case, entanglement between uh, the sender and receiver is, uh, doesn't change the capacity at all if it's a classical channel. Uh, and uh, it's perhaps a bit surprising that, that you, you do get this enhancement from, uh, uh, for a totally classical network because the first thing you kind of do with your part of the entanglement is going to have to be to turn it classical and feed it into the feed, feed it into the channel in some way. So um, it is nevertheless uh, possible to find examples of channels where there is an enhancement in the capacity region. So down here, I have a picture of uh, a capacity region for uh, for a uh, uh, for a particular channel and. Uh, that's what this inner curve is. And then you can see some dot here 
that's the that's the rate that you can achieve or the rate pair you can achieve when you allow the senders to use entanglement as well to coordinate their communication strategies. And one thing I just wanted to I wanted to mention that I, th I thought was a lot of fun was that you know this this uh, multiple access channel it's like the canonical solved information theory problem in in the uh, multi user setting and uh, nevertheless we're able to show that if the problem of approximating the capacity region of a channel that has uh, n dimensional inputs uh, if you want to approximate it to within one over n cubed actually this is an np hard problem. Uh, so even though we have a single letter formula for the th for, for the capacity region we're interested in, uh, it's not something that it's not an optimization that can be done efficiently. It's something that looks, you know, at least for certain channels, it's going to be a super hard thing to do. Um, the a final thing I wanted to say about this is um, is that what we have at the moment is sort of an example where we see this enhancement. Um, but what we've learned about non-additivities of this sort is that when you find an example, generally as you study and look for this effect that you find uh, more carefully, it tends to pop up nearly everywhere. So what we're looking at now is trying to figure out whether an entanglement can help more natural channels. So for instance, a, a nice candidate for this is a, a Gaussian MAC. So uh, a, a Gaussian multiple access channel, we, we sort of have good reasons to think that, that there'll be possibility of enhancing its capacity region with entanglement as well. So we're just gonna jump over this little story. It's not related to the original, oops, the original talk. Ah, ah. And let's go to our summary. I just wanna say that, um, you know, quantum capacities, they capture the value of a noisy quantum resource. Um, we find that interactions between Many quantum resources tends to be non tend to be non additive. We saw a really strong non additivity in the form of superactivation, where we had these two zero capacity quantum channels working together to get positive joint capacity. And uh, this non additivity leads to challenges. It's hard to evaluate capacities and understand what the best strategies to use over uh, a quantum channel are. But it's also an opportunity because it leaves open the possibility of finding better recipes and new effects that uh, enhance our communication capabilities. And finally, I told you about uh, the classical multiple access channel and how a classical network can be enhanced by entanglement shared between uh, users. And uh, this was sort of a, a specific non-trivial interaction to accomplish a totally non-classical task, which is what, uh, you know, which is one that sort of uh, you might have thought uh, uh, wasn't possible. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, the organizers for having me, to you for uh, attending the talk, and also to my students here for uh, helping me, helping with uh, with all of this research. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, are there any questions?